says, It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Obviously, taking refuge in God is the safest place we can be. Everything else will fail us. The government, our families, our friends, our loved ones, they will try their best, but they're limited too. Only God is where we should go for refuge. Let us pray to him. Let us repent of our sins. Let us go into his presence. Empty yourself, if you would, as we pray together in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father in heaven, mighty God, we humble ourselves before you. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who is righteous and holy. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God of love. Even though we are sinners and rebellious, we have turned from you. You have provided a way, and that way is your Son, Jesus. We believe that he is the Christ, the Messiah, who died on the cross for us. Lord Jesus, you became our sin, and you died, and you took our place. You shed your blood, and that blood, Lord, we claim it, Lord, because we claim your sacrifice. You were raised in power and alive today, and your spirit is in us. Help us, Lord. Let your spirit, Lord, lead us and guide us. Let us worship you. Let us glorify you and please you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for every soul. Every person, every family, Lord, that's represented, that hears and takes part in this service, bless them as only you can. Bless them, Lord, with your, your wisdom, Lord, and your patience and your love, Lord. Bless them, Lord, with your protection, Lord, and help us, Lord, to draw near to you. Oh, Lord, help us to put ourselves away and give this time to you to truly worship you in spirit to please you. Thank you, Lord, for making it all possible through your Son, Jesus. For it is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Oh, for a thousand tongues. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great sinner's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumph of His grace. My gracious Master and my God has sent me to proclaim, to spread to all the earth abroad, the honors of my name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. His music in the sinner's ear, his life and help and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest plate, His blood availed for me. Amen. Amen. Now arise and sing. Arise and sing, it shall run a giant for the Lord has a shepherd deed. Arise and sing, it shall run a giant for the Lord has a shepherd deed. Open up your heart and rejoice before Him. Open up your heart and rejoice before Him. Open up your heart and rejoice before Him for the Lord. As the liberty, what the dead flee? In all the time, your children are dying for the Lord, and the dead are dead. Arise and sing, your 
chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Sister Blank will read for us this morning in the Korean language. Sister Blank, please. 오늘 하나님이 주신 말씀 스바냐 2장 1절부터 3절입니다. 수치를 모르는 백성들아 모일지어다 모일지어다 명령이 시행되어 날이 겨같이 지나가기 전 여호와의 진노가 너희에게 내리기 전에 여호와의 분노의 날이 너에게 이르기 전에 그리할지어다. 여호와의 규례는 지키는 여호와의 규례를 지키는 세상은 모든 겸손한 자들아 너희는 여호와를 찾으며 공의와 겸손을 구하라. 너희가 혹시 여호와의 분노의 날에 숨김을 얻으리라. 아멘. Amen. Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 1, 2 and 3. Gather together. Gather together, O shameful nation, before the appointed time arrives, and that day sleeps on like chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility, perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of of the Lord's anger. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, your holy word, and thank you for this message, and I thank you for the people who are here to receive it. I pray, Lord, that all we say and do here would be pleasing to you and in your perfect will, and that we would draw near to you through this message. Help us, Lord. You know our weaknesses. We know we need you. For it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning I'm going to speak to you about God's love. God's love. You know, as you know, the book of Zephaniah, as other minor prophets, it's a small book, pretty small book indeed. And, and as I was looking at it and studying it and trying to prepare for it, I, I found it sort of hard to just preach from one chapter. Because it's so small, these chapters, uh, there's so much in each chapter that it depends upon each other. So, so please keep your Bibles open to Zephaniah because we will be looking at other parts of the book and even other scriptures too. You know, God's love is a tender love. But it's also a tough love too. God is a God of justice and as well as a God of mercy. And it's from both his justice and his mercy that God deals with his people. He don't just deal with us just in mercy, but he also deals with us in his justice because he is a holy and righteous God. In Zephaniah's prophecy, we see both sides of God's love. We see his tough love in his judgment upon his people, and we see his tender love in his mercy because he continues to call upon his people. You know, most people, they like to think of God of only a God of love and mercy. And I wish that was true, but then God would not be God if that's all he was, was love and mercy. And this is what I encounter with many people 
when I try to witness to them or I try to talk to them about God, they only want to hear about his love and his mercy. I find it interesting, very interesting, in when I try to convince sinners that they must repent of their sins, not only repent of their sins, but they must accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know what most of them quickly say? They look at me and say, well, you're not spreading God's love. And I think to myself, actually, I believe that by sharing the truth of God's Word, along with obvious sins, that is true love. The truth is the truth, is it not? Would I love people if I didn't tell them the truth? What does show a lack of love is when we don't tell others of the judgment to come and the, how they need to repent and accept Jesus Christ. If we don't tell them that, how can we say we love them? And when we talk to those who have accepted Jesus Christ, it shows no love if all we say is, don't worry, life will get better, and God will always bless you, and you'll have a good, Christian, happy life. Because we know that's not true, right? Instead, true love tells them that this world, in this world, especially as Christians, we're going to have trials. We're going to have problems. Therefore, we need to be courageous and strong because we know that Jesus overcame the world. Hallelujah. And because Jesus overcame the world, we can overcome the world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even though we will experience trials and troubles, we, we eventually will experience God's peace, His joy, His love, and we will experience it forever. Eternally in heaven. Yes, God's love is tender, but it's also tough as well. And that is because God is a God of justice as well as a God of mercy. And it's from both of these aspects that God, again, deals with his people. In Zephaniah's prophecy, we see both sides. Both sides of God's love, the toughness and judgment, and the tenderness in his mercy. To understand, we need to look at what happened in the southern kingdom of Judah during this time. Zephaniah prophesied during the reigns of Manasseh, Ammon, and Josiah. Manasseh was the son of Hezekiah, and what Manasseh did was destroy all the good that his father had done previously. His father was a faithful, uh, godly man who tried to lead uh, Judah in the right way and the following God. But, you see, Manasseh, he set up altars to false gods. He destroyed the good work that his father had done. He, he set up altars to the false gods of the nations that surrounded uh, Israel. He even set up altars for these false gods in the very temple of God. He also allowed the practice of witchcraft and soothsaying and the consultation of spirits and mediums. Second Chronicles 33, 9 says, But Manasseh led Judah and the people of Jerusalem astray, so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. These were God's people. They were doing worse as bad, if not worse, than the other nations around Israel. And this made God pretty angry, pretty upset. And so God allowed the Assyrians to take Manasseh captive. But in his captivity, I must admit, Manasseh seemed to repent. He repented, and he turned his heart to God. The problem was, it was too late for the country of Judah. It was too late for the people of God. God's judgment was already set, and it was already on his people. It was both tough love, as God pronounced his judgment, 
which was also a prelude to the day of the Lord. You see, the day of the Lord was coming, and these people were already suffering some punishment. Now, not particularly just judgment, but punishment. And that's what Zephaniah prophesies in uh, one, two, uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verses 2 through 6. We must be careful, please, all of us. We must be very careful not to tone God's judgment down. Instead, we must see the harshness and the seriousness and the certainty of God's judgment to sink in our understanding. When we know how serious sin is and how God hates sin so much, we must take it very seriously in our lives. We must realize that God is very serious about unrighteousness and ungodliness. He's very serious about it. We may not see the punishment come to those who are ungodly. We may not see the punishment that goes to the unrighteous. But the day is coming. The day is coming. The question now becomes, why did God have to be so tough with his people? Why did God have to be so tough? The answer really is found in how the people treated God. It's how they treated him. Look again at Zephaniah chapter 1. Let's back up. I want you to look at it. Follow along as I read Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. It says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place every remnant of Baal, the names of the pagans and the adulterous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Molech, those who turn their back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. Amen. Now, I especially want to consider verse 6 that we read there. Those who turn their back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. What did they do? Well, they turned their back from following God. First, they turned their back on God. Now, they had returned to their worship of Baal. Many years before, before the father of Manasseh took over, they worshiped Baal. And they worshiped, they, they did so, and they were continuing here. They returned to the worship of Baal. And what's worse is, they worshiped Baal while they were still swearing allegiance to God. They said they were worshiping God. They said they were God's people, but they weren't worshiping God. They were worshiping Baal. They con continuing to maintain a, a godly appearance, if you will, but their hearts were not even close to God. Isaiah described them this way in Isaiah 29, 13. Isaiah said this. The Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules that they have been taught. The prophet Ezekiel also described them in a way too. Here in Ezekiel 33, 31, Ezekiel says, My people come to you as they usually do, and sent before you to hear your words. But they don't put them into practice. Their mouths speak of love, but their hearts are greedy for unjust gain. We could sort of say it this way. They turn their backs on God, but not their face from God. 
maybe this is why they were a stiff-necked people, you know? Today, people say they believe in God, they believe in his word, uh, just not all of it, just the part they like. They serve, uh, they serve God only when it agrees with their own views or when it doesn't mess with their lifestyles. As long as God's word tells them something they're happy with, they're okay, but not everything. They've turned their backs on God by living ungodly lives while still going to church. And while they're still having their faith turned God, they're not really worshiping God. Others have become callous and complacent, and they don't longer care. They couldn't care less. They, they have no desire to change their hearts. They have no desire to repent of their sins. And when confronted with their sins, you know what they're quick to say? Don't judge me. Many people are that way. Not only have they turned their backs on God, but also they have truly, truly failed to seek Him. They desert God's word, God's will, and God's way. God actually brings four specific charges against them in Zephaniah 3, verses 1 and 2, our scripture, part of our scripture this morning. I mean, later on after our scripture. It says, Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. They didn't obey God. They refused to obey God's word for their lives. Obviously, they broke God's commandments. In fact, they probably, I think they probably broke all ten of God's commandments without even worrying about it or without even blinking an eye. For God, one violation of his word is like doing them all. Do you think that you're okay if you only break one of the Ten Commandments? You might as well break them all. If you're going to break one, break all ten of them. You might as well because you're just as guilty with one as you are ten. They also didn't accept God's correction. God continually sent against them one judgment one punishment after another in the forms of pestilence and drought and, and famine and, and even foreign armies. He sent anything and everything to trying to correct their errors and to put them on the right path. But they continually spurned his correction. They continually ignored it. It was all coincidental. It was just part of the world. It wasn't God. That's the way they thought. Now remember this. God's punishment, God's discipline is not meant to harm us. We think it is because that's what we do when we punish. We do it to harm. But God's not trying to hurt us. God is trying to correct us. He's trying to turn people back to him, back to his way, and back to his will. That's why God lets things happen to us. God's not just trying to hurt us. He loves us. He loves us too much to let us continue in our sinful ways. He sets things happen to us so that we'll say, you know, God's punished me. I need to obey. I need to be better. I need to obey God. But they, his people, they continually spurned his correction. So God basically disciplined his people so that they would keep his word. The psalmist says in Psalm 119.67, it says, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now, I obey your word. God's discipline is not for his enemies. His discipline is actually for his children, which he loves. That's the part that we must remember 
Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12 says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father the son he delights in. And yet, we humans, we have such a hard time accepting that, don't we? We do. Because these people, they didn't trust in God, and we're guilty too. The, to trust means to rely upon. Like, I rely upon this chair I'm sitting in right now, and you rely on that chair you're sitting in, right? Right? You trust that that chair won't fall down when you sit in it, right? I trust in this stool right now that it ain't going to fall down with me. And this is the same trust that God wants us to trust Him the same way. If we didn't trust the stool or the chair you're sitting in, you'd be grabbing stuff to hang on to it, wouldn't you? Because it might fall. You ought to see me. Sometimes I've been doing that a lot here lately. But God, you know, we know He's not going to fail us. We must trust him. So he goes to the same type of trust. But their trust wasn't solely on God. The, the nation of Judah, they didn't solely trust God. It was more like, oh, we'll trust in God, but, but just in case, let's make some alliances with the countries around us so that if God doesn't help us, then guess what? Our allies, they'll come, they'll come and help us if God doesn't. We need to be very careful not to place our trust on anything other than God. In other words, don't place your trust in your bank account. Now, I've got to admit, and this is true, yes, it's good to have a bank account. Uh, God wants us to use our uh, act wisely and use our good sense that he gave us. He gave us these brains uh, to make good judgment calls. He gave us uh, hands and abilities to do things, and uh, we can't help others if we can't help ourselves, right? And we become, uh, if we can't, uh, uh, through God's help, uh, do our part, then we're not doing what God wants us to do. So yes, it's good to, to have that bank account. It's good to have the things that God wants you to have, but we need to, to act wisely. But only God, only God is truly and completely trustworthy. I, I have seen people lose everything they've had. And so have you. Businesses after businesses had to close their doors during the pandemic. And many of them didn't come back. Many uh, people who relied only on a paycheck, from there from paycheck to paycheck, most of them lost of all of what they had. Now for so many, nothing is left. In fact, there's so many homeless people now in the large cities because they don't have any place to live. They have nothing. Maybe they should have trusted more in God. They also didn't draw near to God. They had no, no desire to live a holy or righteous or good life. You'd be surprised how many people out there are living totally for themselves. Now, I know you'll see people that are good and do good things. But do you think that's the majority of the people in this world? They have no desire to develop and practice spiritual disciplines that would bring them back into a closer relationship with God. Sometimes you have to work, you know. Sometimes having a relationship with God is not that easy and because we struggle with our sinful nature. Not only do I struggle with myself, I struggle with the sinful nature of other people, even people I love, people who are close to me, they have sinful natures too. We all do. Instead of 
instead, during the, the time of Zephaniah, they preferred to draw near to false gods and the ungodly practices of those around them, the ones that they made alliances with. These countries that they made alliances with, they actually started following their false gods. If we seek anything else or anything less than God, then we have fallen into the sin of idolatry. Now, you may say, Pastor, really, what is idolatry? Well, idolatry is when we make anything or something or someone else equal to God or greater than God. Anything that we'd rather uh, go spend time with than God. Anything that we put first before God. Because Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. You see, when pe- we, we see the, this many times in the cults nowadays and even many organized religions because they're not really seeking God. If you ask them how to get to heaven, they'll say, join our church, do as we do, then you can go to heaven. If you ask me how to get to heaven, I won't tell you to join our church. I'll say, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because that's how we seek God. You see, they are serving an idol in their belief systems and their structures. They are placing their doctrines and their teachings equal with God. They believe, they say, unless you belong to our church, our religion, you do it our way, then you're not going to heaven. That's what they say. And there's a lot of them out there. Some of them probably come to you knocking on your door already. And they'll tell you, you've got to do it their way instead of following Jesus. We must seek God's righteousness. And I I shouldn't have to remind you of this, but Jesus is God's righteousness. We should seek God's righteous standards for our lives, for our families, for our society, for our nation, and for our churches. And the scriptures make it very clear that there's no one righteous, no one, not even a single person that is righteous. Not a single person is righteous. Only the Son of God. Therefore, the righteousness we are to seek after is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I can't say it any plainer than that. That is the truth. He died so that we can be clothed in His righteousness. Clothed in his righteousness makes us acceptable to God the Father. If I have the righteousness of Jesus, then I can stand before God the Father. Because no man, no woman can go to God except through Jesus Christ. Not me, not the church, nothing. Only Jesus Christ. Therefore, the, we must humble ourselves before God. And humility is the opposite of pride. It's the opposite of our own self-will. God's tender love says in Matthew 5, 3 and 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, and blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. In conclusion, there's a very interesting scripture, piece of scripture that I love, that reveals both the tough love and the tender love of God. You should know it. It's Romans 6. 
Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. You can see both the tough and the tender love of God. Finally, in our scripture, Zephaniah 2, verses 1 through 3, God says, Gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the decree takes effect and that day passes like wind-blown chaff before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you'll be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. You know, just when things look their darkest during God's judgment he's still calling his people to himself even they are about to be destroyed they're going to go into captivity many are going to die and they're still sinners and they're still sinning and God is still calling to them that is God's tender love. He has a very hard time. God, you know, God has a hard time turning from his people. He has a hard time turning from his people even though they don't deserve him. Even though we don't deserve God's love. Even though we rebel against him, even though we sin against him, we don't deserve him. He still has a hard time turning from us. He did the same thing with God's people. In the end, what I love about the tender love of God is that we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait to receive eternal life. We don't. It can be ours right now, today. It can be ours. We just need to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus and we shall be saved. Then it doesn't matter what happens to the world. It doesn't matter what happens to the people. It doesn't matter what happens to us. We will be saved in the end. We just need to repeat, repent and believe. And this, it is then when we become new creations. We become born again. We become his children. God's love. Yes, it's tough. But it's also tender. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, have mercy on us, Lord. We know, Lord, that you are a loving God. But you are also a righteous and holy God. And yes, Lord, your love is both tough and tender. And Lord, you don't give up on us. We're the ones that give up on you. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Let us come now, repenting of our sin, and accepting you, Lord Jesus, as our Lord and as our Savior. And maybe, Lord, we already know you as our Lord and Savior, but we've been struggling. We've been struggling in our lives, struggling with our sinful nature and struggling with the sinful nature of others. And we know, Lord, we need to repent. Help us to do that right now. Help us to call on you, to seek you, and to seek your face. Lord Jesus, you told us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Help us to do that. Please have mercy on us and forgive us of our sins. Not because we are worthy, 
and not because we are good, but for your name's sake, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. For you are our God, our Lord, and our Savior. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Let's all stand.